great. We started out with Julianne says, should we do 25 extra chairs? And I'm like, I'm thinking positive, Julianne. I think we should add 25 more. And look, we've already added more. So this is wonderful. What a beautiful day. Welcome to February. Uh, it's my favorite month of the year because it's my birthday month. Uh, and it's just a pleasure to be back here in the loggia at the Johann Fuss Library. I want to thank the foundation for continuing to let the History Center use this beautiful property for this special month of history. Now, as I tell everyone, my name is Betsy Fugate Joyner, by the way. I'm a third generation in the Fugate family, Boca Grand, born and raised, and third generation in my married family, Boca Grand, the Joyner family, uh, which encompasses a lot of the families that were the founders of this island. So I feel very fortunate to be share that heritage. I don't pretend to be a historian, but I like to tell tales. So I try my best to make it a story, to make it fun, and that's why we have the History Center for you to go to to find out the facts. Um, this series is dedicated this whole month to Captain Robert Johnson, who was, was our historian um, for the past 25 years at the History Center. Um, we're actually coming on 30 years, so probably 30 years, that he represented the Boca Grande Island as the historian. Some of that's a little controversial, too, with everyone, but he definitely studied island history, loved island history, and loved to share it. And he got that knowledge not only from his father, Captain Kerry Johnson, who we all loved and respected, those who are fortunate to have known him, but from his grandfather and just his love for his community. Um, so we miss him greatly. He uh, lived a great life, and he uh, passed away in his family home, the quarantine house. That's the oldest home on the island. So we feel like he was pretty blessed. It's been kind of a hard year for the Johnson family because his daughter, Sabrina, also passed in this past December. Um, she was younger than me, but she was an island girl and loved the island also. So I had hoped that maybe um, Robert's son or some of his grandchildren would be here to speak, but they just said that it was a little too hard to come at this time in their life. But they are so happy to know that we're carrying on the legacy. So here I go. You know, Betsy's the crier. <laughs> I can tell jokes, but I always uh, get emotional about my family. So this is our 22nd year, I believe, of History Bites. Um, Sally Van Italy first came up with the idea in 2001. Uh, she asked Robert to assist her in doing it. He took great pride, and he ran it with Sally and with some of our other help all those years until the last couple years and he still had his hand in it up until the last year and uh, he, he I sat yesterday through my little notebook that I have I don't keep all the books that, that Jim keeps but I have a notebook and I went back into 2001 and read the different names of the people that have presented History Bites and fortunately we have them documented. Some of them are not as well done as now that we have a video system that we are videoing them. But, but it is interesting to look back to hear and see just people that spoke since 2001. Um, I was just sharing with Carolyn, who's going to speak next week. I was reading about, how, you know, my mother. Uh, Pansy Cost, who was a library here forever, um, all at Carrie Johnson, uh, the I, just so many people that have spoken through the years, and we do have it's documented. We may not have actually what their talk was to, for you to watch it, but actually it was documented and what the titles were at the History Center. So upcoming this next 
week. Today we're going to share with Kim Kyle, our uh, director of the History Center, and I say she's our historian because she, if she doesn't know the answer, she's going to find it. Most of the time it comes right out of the top of her head. And I'd like to thank Rosemary and Jim Blaha, our archivists and research um, team at the History Center. And I think we have a couple board members here. Trisha Love's here. Witty Ransom is here. I, oh, and Karen Grace is here today. So everybody works hard. We have a new president, it's John Snight Jr., who is a fourth or fifth generation um, Boca, uh, Boca Grand. So we try to keep as much history, local knowledge, but we appreciate our newcomers that come in and we appreciate every one of you that comes and please come to the History Center. Our new exhibit this year is our feature, which we're gonna talk about. It's One Island, Three Hometowns, and they worked really, really hard over the summer in rearranging the small center area that we have to showcase the One Island, Three Hometowns, and it's done very, very well. And uh, of course, Kim, was um, front and center on this book, as she'll share more with you. Bob Edick is over here, who worked on the book also, and Linda, his wife, thank you for coming. And uh, Bob was our archivist for many years. So I think it's gonna be an interesting talk. I do wanna do my little advertising. If you haven't seen the documentary, Hurricane Ian, which so many of us are still seeing it in our own homes and backyards uh, and still seeing it above Grand. This documentary was, was done by the History Center and we had the official showing last week at the Community Center. But now it was done by Island TV Rick Montgomery and if you're not familiar with it, it's bocagrandtv.com and he does have it posted on his TV channel. I think it's running right now four times a day. And it's a little, you know, heartbreaking to see it, but it's also very informative. It shows how our community comes together. We have flyers over there that give you the information so you can continue to look at it. Now, I'm very sad to say, it's good and bad, but uh, Bank of America, <laughs> our sponsor, who has been our sponsor for about 10 years, Kimberly Bleach, who always comes in and shares her little spirit and her little life of fun with us, comes from Sarasota. Um, she had an accident in South America while visiting last month and just had surgery on her Achilles. Africa. Oh. In Africa. South America. Africa. South Africa. Um, that's where her husband is from, and she goes and visits. But she was said, I was having a lot of fun but I am having surgery this week and will not be able to attend. She sends her love to everyone and hopes to be here before the end of our season. So we also like to thank the Shively Charitable Foundation, who is also sponsoring this event. And Scott is actually on our board. He was not able to be here today. But we're so appreciative of our sponsors and we try to have this as a free program but because of sponsorship and your donations to our organization, we're able to keep this program free. So we appreciate every one of you. I think I got finished with the commercials. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I said, this was dedicated to the Robert Johnson, but I think it was dedicated to the Johnson family in the Harbor Pilot history. Um, for those of you who don't know, we had Harbor Pilots here uh, this family, Robert's family came his, in 1988. No. 19, I'm 1888. <laughs> See, I told you I wasn't back, so that's why I came here. Um, and Robert <laughs> continued through, but his cousin Johnny Johnson, who still lives on the island, is also the pilot. So he's the last remaining pilot that lives in Boca Grande. He, I did talk to him, and he's in North Carolina for a few weeks, so was sorry he couldn't attend. But maybe he might make it before the end of the season, too, to share a story with us. But Johnny retired in 2012. So we were very fortunate to have our own harbor pilots here uh, in Boca Grande 
our whole time as we were sh a major shipping port from the um, early 1900s until the port closed down. And even after, when we had Florida Power and Light here bringing the barges in, and then um, Robert and Bumps Kingsmore Johnson Jr., who's Johnny's father, uh, Robert's cousin, they both ended up going to Key West and were harbor pilots down there at, after the port closed here until they retired. And then Johnny said he retired in 2012. This is one of my most favorite books. I don't know if it's available anymore. Uh, this is the History Center book and I had to sign my life away to have it, hold it in my hand. Um, I, don't, I think they might have it at the library. It's called Both the Grand and the Early Days, Memoirs of, an Island, Memoirs of an Island's Son. This was written by Robert's father, Carrie Johnson. And at one point in time, they carried it at the lighthouse. I haven't been able to reach them to find out if they still have copies. There are a few copies. Oh, great, thank you for that. Because we need to, to keep this book it's a very interesting book and talks about the life and times of Oak Grand. And Carrie was a very eloquent man, very well respected businessman, harbor pilot, and very active in our community um, on many boards and things. So this is a, it's not only a fun read, but it's, a, it's an excellent read. Just a, this is another book we have available at the History Center has lots of photos and things, and it talks a lot about the things on the island. Uh, the Gasparilla Magazine had an article about the harbor pilots in um, uh, November, December, that Marcy Short has put together. Excellent, excellent read. So I think there's a lot of information about the harbor pilots. There's a great um, display and workouts at the center that you could hear more about the actual harbor pilots. I don't think I need to go into it because they've been talked about a lot. Uh, at this time, uh, my next one, Black History Month. This is Black History Month, the month of February. We have had three times in History by History, uh, Florence Yelks and Henry Woodworth, who were two ladies who grew up in Boca Grant at the port part of the island. And they spoke at three different times through the years in History Bites. We have some of those recorded, and that's a very interesting listen to if you have time to go hear that. Um, they were very, very much part of our community. And I, as growing up, just a little talk, I don't want to take too much of Kim's time, but a little talk is I was very fortunate because I did grow up here. I grew up in the downtown section of the community. We would go down to the south end, which was a port. It was totally a long way to ride your bicycle to go. But Tricia and some of our girls, we would go down and take a picnic. We'd love to watch the ships, and we'd love to have just that excitement to go and watch all the coming and going. As young girls, we were told, you know, to stay away from the sailors and be really careful. <laughs> um, and grew up and, and working in few gates and uh, at the Pink Elephant and dealt with, you know, they, we couldn't speak their language, they couldn't speak our language, a lot of different people came from different ships. But what an interesting lifestyle to have that diversion of the port of Boca Grande, growing up downtown in the business section and in the, where the school was and everything. And then I married into the family who grew up in the Gasparilla section and fortunate to have many, many stories and many friends that grew up in the fishing village. So I feel like even though I don't remember all, some of it, I feel like I've kind of grown up through the three villages of Boca Grande, and I think it's, it's been really part of my history that helps make me who I am. So at this time, I'd like to pass it over to Kim because Kim is the research. She worked three, four years on this book, and she, Robert, and Charles Blanchard put this great book together. Betsy. Great introduction. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about the process of the book. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. It's called One Island, Three Hometowns, 
picturing the three communities of Gasparilla Island from 1890 to 1960 with rare eyewitness commentary by those who lived the lives. And it's so true. I mean, that's what it came to be. I wanted to give you a little background on the process of how this all came to be and the love and the sweat and the tears that went into it. Um, the process. The idea for the book began in 2005, and I had just been with the Historical Society for two years. I started in 2003, so I'm going on 21 years now. So this project really was already, we were already thinking about it when I was hired. We approached the Gulf Coast Community Foundation and they accepted it as a, a good workable concept and then we got a grant for that as a process to start it. And the seed money that actually helped us get this as an idea to become a book was from Virginia Barnard who was the niece of a longtime island resident, Homer Addison. A lot of you have heard that name, maybe Homer Addison, who built The Temptation. So when he passed away, his niece came to me one day and said, I would like to donate some money from his estate to you with the stipulation that you do a book. So that's how that kind of got started. So. It was a great relationship with her. She shared me a lot of good, juicy stories that I can't repeat. <laughs> but anyways, so we took about 400 historical photographs that were selected from about 2,000 that we had in the Historical Society archives. They became the core images for the visual quality that they had and the ability for them to trigger memories from people who grew up on the island, from longtime island residents. So the background on the oral histories. Approximately 30 interviews, and, and Bob can correct me on this later or add to it, were conducted from about 1998 until 2009, and they became the voices for the pictures in the book. It was an image-stimulated oral history project using images viewed on laptops and memory stories recorded on tape recorders that were typed and transcribed. Oral histories were reviewed for their content and relevance to the photos chosen for the book. As the photos from 1890 to 1960 were selected by the editors, it became evident that we had three distinct cultural areas, hence the name, the three hometowns, the North End and the Placida Connection, which included the village of Gasparilla, which was a fishing village, Center Island, the town of Boca Grande and its community, and the South End, Port Boca Grande, and beyond. This time period of 70 years saw dramatic changes to the island and changed the landscape more than any other time span. So the editors, we thought it was very important that this time span that's on the book be represented so you can really understand what a lot happened during that time. Okay, the purpose. This is from Bob Edick, the archivist. Oral histories are spoken, collected memories of family, friends, places, and beliefs, and cultural experiences unique to each individual. The purpose of this book is to make available to the reader local island life histories that give us a glimpse back in time to the past. The unique information recovered has enhanced our photo database for years to come. The priceless quotes. Okay, the society for the first time made a large part of its photo image archives available to the public in the context of the recollections of people who grew up or lived a long time on Gasparilla Island. Okay, the nitty-gritty of putting the book together. 
The three editors, Charles Blanchard, editor-in-chief, Bob Edick, the chief archivist, and myself, Kim Kyle, we worked for approximately four years, Bob. Yeah, four years putting the guts, I call it the guts, <laughs> of the book together. Part of the year, we worked remotely from different parts of the country during the summer months. I was here in Florida. Charles Blanchard was in Nevada and Connecticut. And Bob Edick and his wife Linda were in New York State. There were a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls back and forth, and this was all before Zoom. So boy, do I wish we would have had Zoom back then. The three of us could have been together at once, but it worked out. It was fun. You don't miss what you don't have. You didn't have Zoom, so we couldn't miss it. But now I think, wow, that would have been great. <laughs> in the winter months, the three of us met here in person on the island and in local areas. And I was fortunate to have time in the summer months to review the transcripts, many of which I personally transcribed and listened to, along with other dedicated trained volunteers. Some are here today, Tricia Lowe, Jean Woods. They did a lot of typing, a lot of transcription was done, and I can't thank all these volunteers enough. Okay, so when I reviewed them, you know, I had taken classes and along with a group of other people on how to conduct oral histories from a professor from the University of Central Florida. I think it was Dr. Walters, Lori Walters was her name. And she came down here to the island and she met us at the home of Ted and Sally Van Italy who were founding members of the Historical Society. And I remember we sat downstairs and had our class. And she told us at that time what the process was for doing oral history so we wouldn't look like we were idiots and didn't know what we were doing. It was very helpful. Things have changed over the years and now we use the video, but back then it was tape recorders. Okay. So Charles Blanchard's quote in the book I thought is is really good and it kind of explains how this book was put together. He says, the disentangling of the material and the bringing of order to the project was, in the beginning, a lot like counting and filing beach sand or raindrops. <laughs> and Bob would agree, that is so true. Take a bunch of sand and try and pick some out of the sand to put in this book. It's, it was hard. It was really hard. So Charles Blanchard has a real gift with words. So that was, I just wanted to make sure that I said that. <laughs> okay, so once we chose the photos, it became easier for me to help with picking quotes from interviews to use in the book. I immersed myself in the stories and the pictures came to life for me. I pretty much hold myself up in, the, in a couple summer months when I could work from home in my little office and didn't have a window in it. And I was back in time. I mean, I was really listening to their voices on the tape, hearing these people's voices. It's hard to transport that into text because you have their inflections, like they talk like this, and you know, you can't put that in a book. It's hard, but, you know, we did our best. But I really enjoyed that, and it was a learning experience for me, and that's when I learned a lot about the history. Hard work and long hours went into the layout of the book. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it, Bob? <laughs> and, and Charles Blanchard would draw, you know, not using a computer or a software program, and he would draw, well, I want this picture here, I want this quote here, and it's like, oh, okay, how is this going to work? But we were very fortunate to have the help of a professional graphic art designer, Elizabeth Van Italy, Ted Van Italy's daughter, and she was working from New York City, right, Bob? And without her, this book wouldn't have come together the way it did. So she did the final book design and she created the print ready file that we could send to the printer to have it look like a first class book. 
It was a very happy day on May 6, 2010, when delivery of the books from Whitehall Printing in Naples was received. And I remember this. 1,049 books in 56 boxes. Yeah. It was like, oh, we're done. <laughs> we're done. Without the interviewers, the interviewees, the people who donated pictures, newspaper interviews, historical accounts, and lectures, this book would not have been possible. So I have a, we have a lot of people to thank that helped us with this. And over the years, it has gained an in interest and popularity. And I think it stood the test of time. And I really think it's, it's, it's quotes from people that we interviewed next to pictures. And it's through their eyes. They're telling us their story of island life. And now I'd like to ask Bob to say a few words, if you would. We're going to bring the microphone over to him. We'd like to thank Bob for coming. He's been going through some health issues, and we're so grateful that he's here today. I'd like to say, first of all, that I recently reread re this book, probably I haven't looked at it for six or eight years after we got it done. And I think it was a really good book from a, putting a little time for the perspective in it. This book is really special. This book is really special because you can op open the book to any page and begin there, and it makes sense. Uh, these people came to life in this book. They, they looked at the pictures we showed them and invoked deep memories from their past, and we recorded and transcribed their memories, <clears throat> and, uh, and it makes it very special. There's a lot of characters in that book that are no longer on the island, and uh, the information would have been lost if we didn't get down and collect it. So uh, I, I think we did a really good job. Charles Blanchard is a, a wordsmith, and uh, he wasn't a computer expert by any means. He had a book or a notebook about two foot by three foot, and uh, when he wanted to put a picture in there, he gave me the picture and tell, told me to make it this size. And he pasted it up in the corner or wherever he wanted. And when he came across the text that he wanted out of the transcript, he would say, I want this text down here. And I would make it the size he wanted. And he would paste it in this book. So this book, I don't know where that, it should be archived uh, so everyone can see it. But that was what was taken to the publisher. Um, and, uh, and she worked it down into this beautiful artistic book from this ragged old notebook that we presented her. But the information that was in that was priceless. And uh, if, if you haven't read the book, you can start any place in it. It'll make sense to you. And it's just... I think we did a terrific job. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. I just wanted to say that I'm Bob's wife. And Bob and Charlie and Kim would come to my house almost every Sunday for four years. <laughs> and I would make them lunch. And they would, I can't say argue, but they would discuss heavily between themselves. <laughs> and how they worked it out and they put it together, it was amazing. I was amazed to hear them. I mean, Charlie was the verbal expert and he knew what the pictures meant. And Bob was the computer expert. And Kim knew everything about the history after reading all the comments from the people. I want to say that this historic society has come a long way, and I really appreciate being part of it in the beginning. Thank you.
Thank you all so much. And I should say a word about Charles Blanchard, because Charles was so much part of our history center and the, uh, all the work for all the years. We have a, a, a several books that he's been involved in since the beginning of time also. And he was here um, as part of his job. He was studying the Calusa Indians, and he's worked for the... Uh, Gainesville for the University of Florida and worked all over the state and and research. He uh, wrote a book that's used in the fourth grade um, school education area about the Calusa Indians and things. And he and Bob and also was, uh, Ted Van Italy and Kim worked together on many, many projects. And we're sorry that he decided to move to Nevada but uh, that's okay, because he's, he's still part of our society. And yes, as Kim said, I thought of that when you were speaking. If any of you remember, at PJ Seagrill, um, Charles Blanchard was our keyboard player that came on uh, once a week on the weekends and played the keyboard at PJ's for quite a few years until he moved away. So he's very much still part of this community. I think, Kim, did you have anything else you wanted to share? Any, anyone have questions? Yes. Um, I don't remember, well, I'm sure I have seen the book before, but I'd love it if you could recount sort of what were the distinguishing characteristics of the three hometowns? What set them apart? What did you learn in the process of the book that either was a surprise or just gave you a good sense of what they were like? Well, I like to tell people that this is a unique, diverse island with, it was a working class industrial island with three hometowns on it. And what I learned about the north end and the town and the south end, they were unique and dynamic in their own different ways. And, and that it's gone now, but I can just, I do pictures and their voices the North End, people lived in houses that were rented from the railroad, and they were commercial fishermen. And they would go out and do their commercial fishing and bring their catches back, and the train would stop at the North End. They would load their fish onto the train, it would be shipped north to feed people. And Captain Freddie Futch remembers as a little boy being told by his father, throw the fish on the train, throw the fish, and he, he didn't understand well, a lot of that fish fed people in Tampa and other places that were hungry, you know, so things like that. And then those same commercial fishermen became the fishing guides for the wealthy people in the winter months. They would be hired for their special guides to take them not only fishing, but hunting in this area back then. It was a great hunting area, you know. It was Placida, Cape Hayes area had a lot of good hunting. So that was unique and diverse. And they had their own little schoolhouse for a while. And there's a great picture in the book of the kids up at Gasparilla standing with their teacher, Mr. Fish, I think it is. <laughs> if you look at that picture, all their haircuts are the same. It's like somebody put a bowl and just cut their hair. It's all the same. And I can't imagine the rudimentary life that they lived up there. But I think they were happy, you know, because Things around them, it was beautiful. They worked hard, but anyways. And then the town of Boca Grande, to me, it came to life when I learned that people that grew up here became entrepreneurs and created little businesses of their own to make a living. And, and over the years, you know, some of these buildings that they could talk. I wish they could talk, you know. And Carolyn and Clyde neighbors can tell you a lot about that, too. Uh, I have great admiration for the self-sufficiency of the people of this island and how they made it work. And then you had people that lived east of town in Tarpon and all that area that was called Whitewash Alley because that's what the houses were painted with, just whitewash. You had a black community east of town just up from where Widdens Marina is. All that's gone. We have hardly any of photos from that area, and we're really looking hard, aren't we, Jim? <laughs> it's 
for the juke joint in the church and where Murdoch, the character Murdoch, who's in the book, where he lived, a lot of good stories. And then the port area was unique too because you had an area for the white workers, their housing. You had the seaboard quarters for the black workers. You had the, the close proximity to the Gulf and the harbor, the fishing, the shrimping. You were allowed to get on the phosphate dock when it wasn't operational. And even if you weren't wealthy in the monetary sense, you were wealthy in that you could get all the seafood you wanted, you know, and things like that. And some of those stories I won't ever forget. So... I hope that helps you understand the process of the book, and I would certainly welcome any questions that you have, and the book is available for sale in the Historical Society, and you're welcome to come in, not just to buy the book, but to see us, say hi to Jim and Rosemary and myself, we're usually there most days, and we're open the first Saturday of every month during season from 10 to 2. The population of the various towns through periods of time. That's a good question. Do you know, Bob, what they were? Well, I think there was more people in Gasparilla Village and the port than there was in Boca Grande. He, he said that there was probably a lot of people full-time living on the island at Gasparilla Village. Tricia? Okay, Tricia Lowe is saying there was around 600 working families on the island. That's a lot for a little island. So, yeah, the north end, there was a lot of people, and then the south end. Yes? I'm just wondering what the impact was on the villages when the bridge went in. Bobby's asking, what was the impact on these three towns when the bridge came in? A lot happened. You know, there were people for it and people against it. You know, that's just the way it is. So once the bridge opened in 1958, that changed the dynamics of the island forever. Those that felt this, they were trapped on the island, they couldn't really go out into the big world, would left. And some people left and didn't come back. And others... It was a convenience. They could travel easier to go to Tampa for the day instead of having to ride the ferry and get your car over to the mainland and get back in time for the last ferry so you could get home. So there were pros and cons to that era, but it changed the island forever. It made it more accessible for people from other places to come onto the island and discover its island jewel and its unique character and charm, which we still have today thanks to the Gasparilla Island Act and many other people who saw this as a unique place and they didn't want it to be like a Naples or a Fort Myers or other places. They wanted to try and keep its character and charm. I think we've done a pretty good job and over the years houses have been bought and sold and changed hands, but there's still a lot of fascinating history here. Yes. How much interaction was there between the three communities? That's a good question. How much interaction were there between the three communities? A lot of the people that could really answer that are, have passed away, you know, but probably not a lot. Yeah. Gasparilla Village was way up at the north end, and I think there was just a rut to get up there. There wasn't even a real road. And then the town of Boca Grande people lived and worked there. They didn't really need to go to the north end or the south end. And the people at the south end, there was also a commissary store down there and the fishing and the workers. You had railroad workers and you had port workers. They lived and worked down there. So probably maybe they got together to go out at night to the, to the bars you know, and have a little bit of fun and let off a little steam. Um, but yeah, they were pretty separate. I think uh, when Kim's addressing that, she's thinking of the earlier times when, yes, a few uh, fishermen, uh, they didn't have cars. 
you know, there weren't cars in town. You didn't, there were only a few cars. I think um, Kingsmore Johnson might have been, had the first car, and I think my father, grandfather Jerome got a car later, and there were just a few cars in town during that time period. But the train um, helped bring people, they would come into town by train. They could catch a ride on the train and come into town, or they could come from the south end to come to town. Um, I think, you know, that there is, as I was growing up, there was communication and working because we, the, in the beginning, Gaspilla had their own school at one time, uh, but I'm not sure what year, I think it was in the 30s, um, probably when the school uh, was central in town, when the school, Mrs. Cranichel helped get the school together, so the children from Gasparilla, children from the South End and, and downtown, uh, so I'd say in the early 30s, late 20s, there was a central activity space for the families and the people to come together. Even the children came from the outer islands in later years by a, 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 a boat, a, a school boat brought the children to school in Boca Grande. And my memories of going to school in Boca Grande, and I'm sure Carolyn can attest to that, are some of the best memories ever because the school was the community as the school should be in our community. All the functions happened there. If there was a, a prom, well, everybody came. All the parents came to the prom. Everybody came to the prom. They had a fish fry um, held every year, a mullet fish fry, and um, our ladies and gentlemen, the community, the teachers, the friends, the parents, and Pansy's cost famous uh, hush puppies were always there. The high school students and some of the fishermen would clean the fish and they went out and got swamp cabbage and you had a great, you know, I don't even know, I mean, I think 150 people maybe or whatever, but every, you know, often for that function, if the kids had a school play, everybody came. Um, so I know from, you know, from the late 30s up until the school closed in the 60s, it was the center of activity. The Cranicho House, which I still have call it the community house, was the center of activity. There was bingo, there were Kiwanis, there were dinners, there were spaghetti dinners. It was the central hub. Um, we didn't so much go to the Gasparilla Inn, and we didn't have the Gasparilla Inn Beach Club until later years, where they did turn in having the fish fries at the beach club in later years. But we had our community, and. I think that's what we're trying to keep, is keep the sense of community. And as Island has changed so much in these past years, and when the port closed down, that was a big, big change in our community. It was a loss. It was a total loss, because we lost so many families who lost their jobs, who had the choice to move to Tampa or to Bartow or to farther to follow the train or to move on. And that was a huge, huge change in the community when the port closed down. The Gasparilla Fishery, uh, Fish Area, uh, Fishing Village, the Fishery moved on over to Placida at one time. And when that, those homes, I believe the last home that was uh, brought from Gasparilla was Isabel Widdens. Joyner's house was in 1960, I think, 59 or 60, when that house was moved into town. And that was like the last house that was there in that area. So that's when things started changing and the community started spreading out a little bit more. Um, and, and I know, you know, we had a Mrs. Willis, when I was growing up, we had a school bus. She drove an old station wagon. She went to the north end and picked up the kids, and she went to the south end and picked up the kids. And, and we did things together, but that had to start it probably in the 40s when that came together. Then we all did. But I know in the earliest days and beginnings, there, there was no transportation. And you kind of lived in your area, and you did your thing, and you shopped. And, and um, I, I just think it's a, it's a great place to have and this book. I, I agree with Bob. I have had the book for I don't know how long. I went out and bought another copy. Um, and I, have, I go through it almost every day because it's like, wow. And you don't. You can just open it up and read a story and look at a picture and a memory comes back. Um, 
And I think that's the same thing about most of these books. And this, this book here, Fisher, Folk of Charlotte uh, Harbor, Bob was involved and wrote that book, and he worked with Carolyn uh, Parks and Neighbors, father who helped him get all the interviews. Um, this is a fabulous book too. Fortunately, this one is not available anymore unless you go on um, eBay or Etsy. I heard it was $100 on Etsy not too long ago. Uh, but this is also a great resource. And fortunately, uh, but with Tommy Parks' help, Bob was able to go into some of these families' homes or meet them on the dock or whatever to get these stories because as he'll tell you, and I find out, uh, trying to find people to speak at History Bites, people are reluctant to get before a crowd and to share, and they don't, you know, think that's necessary, and nobody really cares. You know, these people don't care. These All these new people in Bugger they don't care about, you know, what our life was like. And I reach out all the time and say, they do care. They want to know. They want to learn the history. And we constantly, and I keep reaching out to every one of you here, if you have someone that you think has a story, it could be your story, it could be your, your, you know, your neighbor's story or whatever, get that oral history. Try to find someone to do it. We'd love to have people speak. Um, Andy here, he, I was looking through, he and his mom spoke, Connie Wallace spoke here at History Bites some years ago. I mean, he could tell, get right back up and start telling us stories again because you all never, probably never heard that story. So we can repeat a lot of the ones that have spoken. And thank you because Viola Abbott is going to speak. Uh, not Abbott, Viola Abbott was a black lady <laughs> that lived on the island. Viola Dyer is going to speak from your suggestion. And she's going to speak uh, the end of uh, our last history bite. And, and so we're trying to bring the stories of both the grand from... The how the book got started. Next week, Carolyn Parkinson Neighbors is going to share stories about her mother and the women in the community and also her father, who was such an important um, man in our community, and kind of focus on the downtown area. And the week after that, um, Leslie uh, Porter Joyner is going to speak through her art the stories that Grandma Effie Joyner shared about Gasparilla. And their stories from Grandma Effie, they might not be fact, <laughs> but they're as the way she remembered it, and Leslie has kept, captured it in art. So we'll have that one, and then Viola will speak about her time in Boca Grande as a businesswoman and a, a living on Palm Avenue in Boca Grande from the 80s until still working presently. So I think we have a pretty well-rounded program. I hope you all will come back again and hear it, pass the word. Stop at the History Center. Uh, we've got great, great information there. And Island TV is, works with us. Uh, Rick Montgomery has been so generous to give us his time. And he's helping us with our oral histories in our interviews. So if you don't want to talk up here in front of the camera, in front of all of you, we're trying to get as many people on a video so we will have that information and save it for time. Yes. Any consideration of republishing the one that has uh, run out, and is it still the first publication on the book you talked about? This one, the Fisher Folk book? Yeah. That was, uh, Bob. that was a project that I did for the University of Florida. I'm an anthropologist and, a, and an archaeologist, and we were working on the uh, Indians in the harbor out here, the Coosa Indians, and uh, the archaeologists didn't understand the fishing uh, techniques down here. So they wanted to learn something about the Indians fishing. And the only source we had was to do interviews with the oldest fishermen that were still around at the time to gain the information that they had gained, used before the advent of uh, motor boats and fish finders and all that stuff. And we found out that that there was basically that they, they learned a lot from the Indians on how to fish, and we learned a lot from them on how the Indians fish. So that was the purpose of that book. It was a archaeological <laughs> study. So uh, and uh, it's published by the University of Florida, 
they reprinted it once uh, for some additional. It was printed twice, uh, but it's very limited uh, interest in a book like that. So uh, when it ran out the last time, it hasn't been republished yet. But I'm sure if you talk to the University of Florida, they would be glad to republish some copies. Uh, <laughs> 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 Yes, this is the original, so you would get an original copy. We haven't run out yet, and the problem with reprinting books, as you would all know, it's very expensive, so we obviously would have to get another grant to do a second printing. I haven't done a book count yet, I'm afraid to, <laughs> to find out how many we have left, but we're, we're good, and, this, and I'd be happy to sign my name, <laughs> if you like, in the book. Um, and I just wanted to make a quick comment about people that were left out of the book. I fought with Charles Blanchard on this, and I, I understand it now. He explained it to me. The book would have been too long, too expensive, but there were so many people's quotes that I thought should have been in the book, and I wanted to put them in the back of the book to what's called outtakes so we could get their quotes in there because they were very important. But we just ran out of pages. You know, it would have been too... So, I just want an ode to those people that didn't get in the book. Their memories were just as important as the ones that got into the book. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, this is a question for all, all three of you. Are there any particular stories that really stick in your mind uh, that you ran across in your research? Are there any... Uh, particular stories in this research that stick out in your mind? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the stories, like the ferry and getting married and riding on the ferry and part of that tradition was being thrown off the ferry, I believe, after you got married. Uh, that was one of them. The groom. The groom, yeah. And... Um, Daryl Polk, who a lot of you may have remembered, who owned the Barnacle Hardware Store for many, many years, just a lovely man, shared a story with me that's not published anywhere, and I can, I can say it now because he told me. When he was 14 years old, he drove the school bus. <laughs> he did everything on this island, as we all know. He was fireman, he, everything. Anyways... He told me one time, there was a plan, there was a young girl at Gasparilla Village who wanted to elope. Of course, she had to do this secretly and not let her family know that she was doing this. So, Daryl goes up to the north end to pick up the kids, to bring them into town to go to the school, the community center building. She gets on the back of the bus, puts her suitcase in the bus, Nobody sees her. He drives her into town like she's going to school, like all the other students, and that she stays on the bus. He takes her back up to the north end so she could meet with her fiancé, and she eloped. And he said, if that family found out what I did, they would have killed me. <laughs> but he never told me the name, so... But I just, that, I remember that, so I didn't put that in the book, but there's so many, I could go on and on. Thank you all for coming. I think our time is up, and I hope to see you again next week. We really appreciate it, and stop in and look at the books up here and, and look at them, and I think you can maybe still get that Gasparilla magazine, but definitely this one island, three hometowns, is a must-buy. I wish you could still get these. Uh, other ones. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. See you next week.